Welcome to the D Plus cast, where we discuss everything Disney Plus and beyond in the world of streaming entertainment. On today's show, my, my, as I look around, I see a lot of celebrities among us. I see 11 current affairs, two hard copies, and a genuine Geraldo interviewee. That's right. Today, we're busting out of the Disney Plus box, and we're tackling Con Air. From Jerry Bruckheimer. Nicholas Cage, John Cusack, John Malkovich. Where are they going to land this thing? How do you feel about the blackjack tables? Woo! Buckle up. Con Air. Directed by Simon West. Thank you, and have a pleasant flight. Guys, I'm so excited to be talking Con Air. I'm Garrett. I'm here with Greg. I'm here with Will. And we've got special guest, John Varon. How you doing, John? I'm doing fantastic. And I am so, so stoked to talk about this uh, straight up cartoon of a movie. Perfect film. Perfect. You know, when I first conceived of this podcast, I knew I didn't want to just talk about stuff on Disney+. Plus. I wanted to talk about things that exist under the Disney umbrella. That includes things like Con Air. You know, initially I thought, you know, we could call it like a D plus after dark episode, but that sounded too much like softcore porn. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so here we are, and we're going to start tackling the more adult, adult content. Still kind of sounds like porn. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mickey Mouse made some stuff for adults. So put the kitties to bed and we're going to we're going to have a nice little rated R discussion about maybe the most perfect film ever made. Probably. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. St- okay, maybe Lawrence of Arabia. Okay, Lawrence of Arabia and Con Air. Oh yeah, no, it's in the it's in the conversation. Sure, it's definitely one of the best Die Hard likes. Um, like top okay, five so- Die Hard likes. <laughs> so let's let's start off with the breaking news that this was Will's first time seeing Con Air. Oh yes. Yeah. Shocker. Yeah, I think I missed most great movies in between the 90s and 2008s, 2010s probably. What was your deal? Were you like were, were you like Amish? Were you on a kibitz? What was going on? I don't actually know. I think I, I was just more of a TV guy, you know? I didn't really my family didn't really go to the theaters that much and I wasn't allowed to see rated R movies until I was 18. Okay. Um, so just protective, you know, that kind of thing. If this was your first time seeing Con Air, then I assume you haven't seen any of the other holy trinity of Nick Cage 90s uh, action films. Have you seen The Rock? Have you seen uh, I saw The Face Rock Off? replaying on TV a long time ago. Like Super one doesn't of those. count. So yeah, doesn't I, count I believe all. that. And I did finally watch Face Off like a year ago and it was amazing. Yes. I've never seen Face Off. Oh, can we do another one oh, of these dear. with Face Off? Can <laughs> okay. we please? Okay, do let face me write off? this down. <laughs> <laughs> did you not have Will? Did you, you? You just said you you weren't allowed to see rated R movies till you were eighteen. Did you not have the sketchy friend? Because I was raised in a strict home as well, and that's how I saw my rated R friends. Is I had a sketchy same, friend. same. I had the sketchy friend with the black box. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, <laughs> for all those kids listening out there, you used to have a cable box, and then you could you know, pay the cable guy uh, a little extra bucks to put something on that box that would get you all of the scrambled channels. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's how I saw all of my rated R movies in the 90s. Yeah. I probably saw Speed like a hundred times. I think Con I was Air. the sketchy friend because I had <laughs> that box. Yeah. If you didn't have a sketchy friend, then yeah, you were. Yeah, that See, was my It's like a poker friend. table. My sketchy friend was more into like burning things. So it would be like a lot of outside. Let's make napalm out of this. So didn't get to watch uh, as many rated R movies. Wow, that's life in Kentucky, huh? Yeah, it is. <laughs> My sketchy friend down in Louisiana did not feel the need to choose between those activities. <laughs> that's fair. There was a lot of uh, napalm making. There was a lot of replica weapons around. Sure. Um, and then at night we would watch... Uh, Either, you know, some uh, aliens or uh, True Lies or this or The Rock or whatever. I'm jealous. I'm jealous, man. Or Emmanuel in Space. On late or Emmanuel in Space. Or, or <laughs> Flesh Gordon. Um, yeah. So, so this, this uh, Con Air uh, came out, was released on June 6th, 1997. So let's, let's talk about 
June 1997 and talk about like what was what was going on. Mm -hmm. So June 1997, uh, the United States jobless rate was the lowest since 1973 at 4.8%. Those were the good old days, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So a perfect film comes out at like the best time to be Be best economic times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a jury votes for the death penalty for Timothy McVeigh, which is actually fitting. We're talking about a movie about a bunch of murderers mm, and, yeah. and, and cons. And considering and how many all... get away at the end. <laughs> right. Good thing we put <laughs> McVeigh down. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the historic tobacco settlement reached $368 billion paid to uh, states that, you know, changed how cigarettes were marketed. So you, no more grocery store shopping carts with palm all uh, uh, ads and Marlboro men and attached me to them. I'm wrong, but all those like cigarettes harmless or like truth sort of ads now are actually funded by tobacco companies as part of that settlement. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So a lot of <laughs> like when you watch those, you're watching a company doing community service. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about the biggest tragedy. Uh, the fact that this movie only has a 55% on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm. Mm. I, f- I feel like there needs to be a feature that Rotten Tomatoes has where we can, as a society, revisit a movie maybe 20 years later and, you know, recontextualize it and sort of discuss it and give it a new score. You know, sort of like how AFI had their top 100 movies and then 10 years later they redid the list. Yeah, they do actually allow that feature on Rotten Tomatoes. I'm looking at famously maligned at release movie uh, Blade Runner, and Blade Runner's at 90% on Rotten Tomatoes, and everybody hated it when it came out. It flopped. That's a shame. That's a shame. I mean, we live in a divided country. It's true. (laughs) Oh, so like in like 10, 20 years from now, UA Bowles Postal could get, it could get its score back. It can potentially turn it around. It'll be a huge hit. No, no, not Postal. Oh, okay. But uh, something <laughs> something good might, yeah. <laughs> it's fair to say, looking at the uh, Con Air Rotten Tomatoes right now, the audience score is 75% fresh. So too low. That's way too low. I, I, that's yeah. fair, but it is over 400,000 ratings, too, which I think is pretty impressive. Okay, but let's, let's, let's all be honest with each other. This movie's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Oh, for sure. Okay, we'll get to that. We'll get to the ridiculousness of this movie, but we need to sort of... You know, put this thing into some context, okay, especially fair. the fact that this was a hell of a year for Nicolas Cage. Yeah. Talk about like a calendar, like maybe a, maybe 18 months. So in 96, he wins the Oscar for le- leaving Las Vegas. Did, yeah. Yeah. He, he, he wins the Oscar for leaving Las Vegas. Then in June of 96, he stars in The Rock, which makes three hundred and thirty five million dollars worldwide. Then a year later. Almost to the day, on June 6th, 1997, Con Air comes out, Mm -hmm. makes $224 million at the international box office, and then, what, less than two weeks later, June 19th, face-off, friends. Face-off. He shot the two movies back Basically $245 million. uh, He basically just left Con Air's set to go go shoot this, or to go go shoot face-off, rather. So, yeah, this was... This was like his vaulting from, you know, he spent the 80s and early 90s as sort of the indie out there guy doing, uh, you know, uh, Kiss of the Vampire, whatever that movie's called, uh, where he thinks he's a vampire. Um, And things like Zandali, which if you guys have never seen Zandali, if you think his accent in this is bad, (laughs) he plays a bohemian artist who lives in the French Quarter and is scheming on James Spader's wife, I believe. Or no, it's George Reinhold's wife. Um, I understand includes, the confusion. Yeah. <laughs> it includes the line, I want to shake you naked and eat you alive, Zandali. Um, yeah. Then when he can't have her, he covers himself in paint and screams a lot. It's great. Um, but then after leaving Las Vegas, it feels like he took a career turn. And The Rock is really, for me, that inflection point for him. Yeah. Um, where he became an A-list action star for a while. Um until eventually he wasn't. Uh, and this this is like, The Rock is him as like, I feel like it's a really, it's, I honestly feel like it's a better role for him than Cameron Poe is because he plays like the bookish fish out of water who has to rise to the occasion. Whereas in this, he plays a role that I think is better suited for like a Jean-Claude Van Damme. I'm going to go ahead and say it. Uh, I think that, I think that Nicolas Cage is maybe the weakest part of this movie that I enjoy. 
Oh, wow. Because I, I have a different take where I think John Cusack is the weakest part of this movie. I would love to see somebody else in that John Cusack role. Uh, first off, the way his suit fits him, it's it's like a size too big. Look, man, 1997 uh, was not a good time for suits. It was hey, just... I, the, the older gentleman boss uh, had a suit that fit him well. Sure, it was a dated suit, but it was his sleeves weren't too long. Everybody was doing like a David Byrne thing at the time. Um, we were all just living through yeah. that. And we didn't get back to like good fitted suits until like the 2000s. I think what's so funny about John Cusack being like, the second build guy is that I think most people, I know that I personally, when I think about Con Air, John Cusack's like the 11th actor that I come up with in my head. Like I don't even, I I totally forget he's in the movie until I start watching the movie again. I go, oh yeah, he's like the number two actor, I guess. Yeah. Based on the uh, trivia and fun facts that I was able to find, John Cusack uh, is appreciative that you forgot that he was in this movie because he hates it and refuses to be interviewed about it. It's true. Um, but this is a murderer's row cast. Like, I think that the fact that we think about him so late is more a credit to the cast than it is a demerit to John Cusack, who I, I do think turns in a good performance. And I'll reach to the Internet and fight you, Eric. Um, <laughs> I'll do it. But yeah, you've got you've got Cage, of course. You've got John Malkovich, who leaves. I'm surprised there aren't teeth marks all over that plane from all the scenery he's chewing. Interestingly enough, this was Jerry Bruckheimer's first produced film as like a solo act after his producer partner, Don Simpson, uh, and he broke up. And this is the first movie where we see the Bruckheimer driving down the road, lightning hitting the tree intro logo. This is the first one? This is the first movie. Wow. I had no idea. And now it's just so iconic. You just know what you're getting when you see that logo, but... You know, so The Rock, Con Air, and Face Off, the hat trick, the holy trinity, whatever you want to call it, of Nick Cage action films, all three of them have Mickey Mouse's hands. Yeah, they do. In that pot. Mm -hmm. Uh, Face Off, you know, uh, it was split a little bit with Paramount, but The Rock, Disney, Con Air, Disney, Face Off, Disney. Now, granted, it's under Touchstone Pictures, which I always love this. I love people who hold a company like Disney up on some sort of pedestal, like they represent something. And I'm, and I'm just like, do you, do you not know that they have different company names that they use to give people other types of projects? Do you think they're just giving you Aladdin and Lion King? No, they're giving you, they're giving you Nick Cage running through fire, punching a guy in the nose so his brain explodes how does i don't we'll get to that too but uh so so we're talking the 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 holy trinity of nick cage action movies so this is probably the perfect time to play a great game of fuck mary kill mm. okay oh my god so you got the rock con air face off fuck mary kill how what are you doing how? Greg, you go first i gotta think how do you do this i i've got uh, my answer i've thought about <clears throat> this i am fucking face off because it's just so ridiculous plus that uh uh somewhere over the rainbow shootout scene is just something i could put on at any moment i am marrying con air and i'm killing the rock and i know that is controversial right i think any i think any answer is controversial here i know it's controversial and the only thing i can sort of compare these three movies two uh in in some sort of like way to evaluate them is maybe baseball statistics you are just losing me harder and harder by the second time (laughs) stay with me stay with me here stay with me okay so i think the rock has the most home runs has the most home runs out of all three of these movies okay but i think con air has the highest batting average which means there is not a dull moment in Con Air. There is not a fast-forward through moment in Con Air. It's all filler, no filler. It's true. It's wonderful, right? And I think, you know, Face Off has, you know, enough RBIs and runs batted in where where it's it's it it keeps itself afloat amongst the ridiculousness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I just, you know, listen, you're faced with a hard decision. I gotta kill The Rock. And I know The Rock is part of the Criterion Collection. Wait, what? Maybe being... They let in that and Armageddon, also brought to you by Touchstone Pictures. Thank yeah, you. Uh, great. 
Thank you, Disney. Two, two Michael Bay movies in the Criterion Collection, Armageddon and The Rock. I would watch Armageddon nine times before I'd watch The Rock once, I think. I don't understand uh, you at all. Yeah, listen. <laughs> Armageddon you know, is a garbage film. How See, dare you? Uh, I love huh. Armageddon for the first 45 minutes. The second they get into space, it gets... It's just an hour of like I I'll grant a you shaky that. cam until yeah. we get the final minutes. moment. But Will they don't they don't get into space until like an hour ten? Okay, well the first movie. hour ten is great then. <laughs> well, but, that's like half the movie. Sure, I know, and I love Armageddon, but Ugh. I can understand why people wouldn't like it for that second half, where it's just like, all right, I can turn the movie off now. It's absurd. Anyway, um, <laughs> fuck Mary Kill. Uh, I will say um, I'm going to uh, fuck Con Air. Because uh, of the three, I think it's going to give me the wildest ride. Um, okay. I say this to someone who hasn't seen Face Off, um, but I, I feel like I feel like Con so you Air can't play this game. Me... You yeah. can't play this game, John. I'm oh, sorry to even play ask the game. You. Let him play the game. Yeah. It's... Thank you, Will. You're welcome. Um, no, he's kicked out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I, I think it's I think it's going to it's 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 going to give me an adventure. I'm marrying The Rock because of the three, I think the The Rock is the most mature film. Um, and I feel like The Rock's got a little stability. I think Stanley uh, Ipkiss, I believe, is his name. Oh, no, Goodsman. No, that's, Stanley that's Goodsman. The Mask. That's yeah. yeah, Stanley Ipkiss is the fictional character Jim Carrey plays in The Mask. Stanley <laughs> Goodspeed is uh, the character in uh, in The, the Rock. The Rock, yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah, he's, you know, he's a chemist. He's an analyst. He didn't ask to be here. He's not even supposed to be here today. I feel like he's going to be able to provide me with some semblance of, dom- of domestic bliss while still taking me on Alcatraz adventures. And plus, okay. his wacky uncle... Uh, Sean Connery is going to show up every now and then and I get to know who killed Kennedy it's awesome um, <laughs> and face off I'm going to kill because I ain't seen <clears throat> face off and I fear what I don't understand perfect you should uh, probably check out face off as soon as you can so Con Air uh, nominated for two Academy Awards including best sound and best original song which I would play some of it now, but I'm afraid that when we upload this episode to YouTube, the algorithm will recognize the Trisha Yearwood version of God. What the hell's the song? Well, it's called How Do I Live? live? How do I and, live? Uh, how do I live without you? It's it's just How Do I Live, Garrett, and it's fine. Um, you, you, you don't you don't you don't have to play it. It's it's okay. You should definitely will. Let's have two edits. The uh, the, the the audio edits gotta have it. We just remove it from the YouTube down. Or yeah, you sure. could or you could not include it because you like your audience. I'm gonna play it right now. <laughs> what kind of life would that be? Ooh, oh, wow. I love I love the fact that they didn't use Leanne Rimes's version of this song, <clears throat> so they had Trisha Yearwood re-record it that was nominated for an oscar by the way that 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 is the sole oscar nomination to my knowledge for con air is no a... two best sound and best original oh, song you got best sound. Good for you. Ah, yeah, and it was it also it was also nominated for the razzie uh for best so- for original song good good so <laughs> there you go john yeah it didn't win either so it was neither the best yeah. nor the worst song that year so let's get into this movie. You guys want to dive right in? Oh, God, yes. De- oh, desperately. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we open up uh, Con Air with uh, Nick Cage's glorious accent. Uh, can it, we park it, on the accent for a second? Just... <laughs> Wait. God. We, hold on. We open with Powers Booth. He does the voiceover. Powers Booth oh, does really? the voiceover? Yeah. Powers Booth does the voiceover about the American, uh, the Army Rangers. That's funny because I kept thinking that MC Ganey, who plays Swamp Thing, was mm-hmm. Powers Booth. <laughs> <laughs> and then I looked it up and I was like, oh, no, it's that guy from Lost. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Powers Booth does that voiceover. Huh. Um, yeah, I, I, as the sole Southerner here, I just like eh. to point out, wait, who else? Where, where are you from? Uh, Kentucky. Okay. Yeah. We, 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 That's why uh, I went, eh. Yeah. No, <laughs> Kentucky is the <laughs> South. We, we all, we all count you as the South, Will. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone, no, everyone you, outside you of the South counts us as the I'm South. I'm sorry. So, so, so it's okay. Will, uh, I, I didn't mean to exclude you, but I feel like you, you probably have an opinion on this. Have you ever met anyone from the American South? <laughs> 
with an accent like Nicolas Cage's in this movie. I have not. No. <laughs> it's, un- it's unbelievable. No. And I read on IMDb, he actually went to Alabama to perfect the accent. Guys, I've spent time in Alabama. No one in Alabama talks like that. He's doing <laughs> he's doing the laziest Hollywood version of a Southern accent where you drop your R's and you talk like you're a fucking Georgia plantation owner and no one talks like this. Like everybody in Alabama talks like they're a goddamn redneck. They, yeah. they sound like this when they talk. Um, and they all got names like Scooter and Cooter and Skeeter and Cater. <laughs> <laughs> so we're introduced to Nick Cage perfect accent uh, at, 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 the bar, at the bar where his, his girlfriend, uh, Garrett, what's her name? You know the actress. Uh, Monica Potter. Monica Potter. Monica Potter, Potter coming over as a pregnant Trisha waiting for... Nick Cage to come back from, uh, I guess, training? Uh, Yeah, well, it it sounds like he's being, like, honorably discharged in a ceremony, which I don't think happens. (laughs) 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 Um, Because it sounds like like Powers Booth is like, well, you guys did your time. Thanks for being Rangers. Go be normal people now. (laughs) Um, And, like, it seems like he's been away for a while, but Monica Potter does not look pregnant in the least in this scene. Well, no, maybe she's maybe she's in her first trimester, you know. But they act like they haven't seen each other in forever. When was this baby conceived? Oh, cheer! I I I never even thought about that. That is a very good point. (laughs) These are the things you got to think about. (laughs) No, these are the things you're supposed to not think about, Will. (laughs) Uh, So so yes, we were introduced uh, to Monica Potter's character who works at this sleazy bar where the dudes are always hitting on her. Nick Cage, this Uh is his first time Cameron Poe stepping into uh, this bar and seeing, seeing the kind of the treatment that his girlfriend gets. He's not, he's not really fond of the way that they're treating her. And next thing you know, he's fighting in the rain and murdering a man. Before we get to fighting in the rain, we maybe get one of the funniest lines in the entire film. Let's dance. Chicken shit. Because pussies like you be lost being now. I'll tell you that. Because of pussies like you, we lost in Vietnam. Okay, so Con Air, Con Air uh, comes out in 1997, okay? This this fella who's causing a ruckus, let's say he's maybe in his mid-30s. Let's say he's 35. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's a so hard 90, 35, but I'd buy it. I'll even give you a 40, okay? Okay, yeah, give me 40. Right? Okay. So, so, so <laughs> the fall of Saigon was in 1975, so you're talking 22 years. So at best, this this guy was 18 years old when the Vietnam War ended. So is he just resentful that they lost the Vietnam War before he could get shipped off? I can answer that. Yes. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I like there are people talking like this uh, and Will can back me up on this. There are rednecks talking like this to this day. Um, there are people who weren't alive when Vietnam was going on going like, ah, all the hippies made us lose Vietnam. Like there's a sentiment among uh the saddest of the rednecks that like wars are the same thing as football games yeah it's it kind of <laughs> sounds like it kind of sounds like patriots fans who say like you know if it wasn't for that that no holding call on eli manning in the super bowl the patriots would have gone 19 and 0 and it's that's exactly it. the same um it's the same thing you, you, you got it yeah because the thing that people don't understand is that's not a statement on how trivialized war is in Alabama. It's a statement on how seriously football is taken in Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> so Nick Cage fights this redneck in the rain, th- uh, three guys actually, in self-defense. Three guys. And, Handicap match. Well, and I, he... I, I'd, I'd like to interject just real quick that it's not exactly self-defense. This is like a moment of character development we got for Cameron Poe because he could have gotten in the car. He we could. saw that these guys were like, they hadn't been too aggressive. They were being threatening. He could have shut the door and drove away. But we heard uh, Monica Potter say, you were that guy for a second. So we hear That's that right. this guy's got a That's pass true. where he will fly off the handle and he's trying to keep that rage kind of bottled up. But he makes the choice to go back and whip these guys' asses. And he didn't wow. need to do that. Wow, John, definitely on the, the prosecution side of this case. <laughs> <laughs> Put that fucker away. His hands are deadly weapons. Well, <laughs> speaking of prosecution, so he, he kills this one dude. And then the next thing we know, uh, Nick Cage's terrible lawyer telling him to plead guilty because he's definitely only going to get one year max. I mean, you're talking the worst lawyer on <laughs> earth. Okay, and I even wrote this down. 
<laughs> Loy- lawyer. Okay, this is this is what you, his lawyer tells him. You could get ten years, plead guilty, get four, serve maybe a year. Okay, now usually I've seen enough Law and Order episodes to know that that when a lawyer is telling their client that that lawyer is supposed to be talking to the prosecution, mm-hmm. and the prosecution's probably talking with you know the the judge. There will be some sort of plea deal that the judge will play along with. Yeah, the idea is that if they're if the if the attorney's telling his client that it's because an offer has been made. Right. Yes. It's not just a guess. <laughs> like, <laughs> this guy, he's just. Eh. Feels like four years. Just finger in the air. Um. Uh, so let's see. So then that takes us that then that takes us into a, a wonderful montage. Montage with mm-hmm. uh, love a good with, montage with some great voiceover from Nick Cage as he <laughs> writes letters home in his in his accent. We hear him and his little daughter writing letters to each other. He's doing vertical push ups, just completely up against the wall, pulling doing uh, pull ups on a pipe that will definitely yeah. not hold his weight. No. Dude's working out like Katie in Cape Fear, like he's going to go kill his defense attorney after he gets out of prison, which honestly, in this case, I don't blame him. That yeah. should have been the first stop. Yeah. And we also Maybe get introduced to his diabetic roommate, played by McKelty Williamson. Mm-hmm. Uh, A.K.A. Bubba. Bubba from Forrest Gump, as maybe he's best known, but he's a... He's a working character actor. This is the first instance of uh, if we can if we can chat structure for just a second. This is mm-hmm. the first instance of the movie setting up it's like Die Hard in a uh, structure because the way you know this this movie is clearly a Die Hard ripoff in that every uh, '90s action movie was a Die Hard ripoff to some degree. You have a contained location. It's been taken over by the forces of evil. There's someone on the inside. They've got to balance between not being found out and helping the good guys who are on the outside. Uh, you know, see also um, Speed, Speed 2, Under Siege, Under Siege 2, Passenger 57, uh, and on and on and on. Um, Air but, Force One. Air Force One. But the, what this movie's doing and what all those movies do when they're smart is they set up all these dominoes at the very beginning that they can just knock down to create tension. And the first of our dominoes is McKelty Williamson is a diabetic. And if you have like two brain cells to rub together, you know that that diabetes is going to become a plot point later in this movie. And it's going to be R.I.P. Wilford Brimley. Mm, Wilford Brimley. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry I pronounced diabetes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yes, yeah, so obviously later McKelty Williams diabetes testing supplies are, are damaged and that that's a huge plot point. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I guess the next big moment in the film is the introduction of this plane and of what is going to happen. We meet U.S. Marshal John Cusack. We meet Cole Meany, who's in the DEA, and we learn about this undercover DEA agent they're going to put on the plane because he's got to get some information out of uh, one of the other uh, Yeah, let me guys. let me tell you about this plot device when you basically get a, you know, a laundry list roll call of the characters you're going to be spending time with. I love it. I love it so much. I uh, love it in Armageddon. I love yeah, it in this movie. Suicide it's, Squad. It, you... I love it in Armageddon. <laughs> I love it in this movie. And also it's in Suicide Squad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's awesome when it's done right because there's nothing I hate more now as somebody who's, you know, who's who's feeling mortal and knows that there's an end to my life coming. Uh that I, I hate wasted time in a movie. And if you could give me something in 60 seconds that so many movies now would give you in probably 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. It's a pro wrestling it. level of efficiency. It's just the so announcer good. putting over the talent is what it is. Love yeah. It. So then that's it. They, as they we're, we're, we, we meet our U S Marshall and DEA characters. And then like practically immediately they're going, and here's, who's going to be on the airplane. It's Ving Rhames, it's Malkovich, Cyrus the Virus, it's Dave Chappelle and Danny Trejo, and also Billy Bedlam, uh, who, who is he as an actor? We don't know. That doesn't matter. He'll doesn't function matter. in later. Nick Cage will kill him. There are <laughs> bunny and box-related tragedies in his future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's a great roll call. I love that everybody's got their own like logline level uh, identity, and you don't really need more than that. Like, you know, you've got Diamond Dog as an unscrupulous Black Panther-like who's written a book. Um, don't really love the way he's portrayed in, in, in 2020 eyes. Given yeah, now I'm like, he's got some points, you know? Yeah. In, the NRA is like mm-hmm. uh, the, yeah. the worst 
version of white nationalism. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff we can examine that does not age well from this movie no, in terms of, I, you know. I do love how the DEA side of the plot, the whole idea that they've got this informant because there's someone that's going to be on the plane that they need information from, like dovetails into the prison break plot. Because, spoiler alert, they're going to take over the plane. And yeah. uh, their whole plan is to land in an airfield and have some guys from the cartel that the DEA agent wants to get information on to pick them up. And that's a really nice, like, little bit of economy that mm-hmm. I don't know if it was why it w- if it would have been wise to like leave the DEA agent alive longer and pay that off in a different way. Um, but I think that's kind of a different movie, and we maybe don't need that movie. Um, I'm pretty happy with the movie we got. That'd be pretty interesting. I felt I felt like personally with the DEA angle. I thought there were the justification of like the DEA wants to get this information before the FBI gets jurisdiction over this case. That felt a little weak to me. I mean, maybe that is the way that these agencies operate. But I was like, come on, guys. Well, that's a that's a hallmark of the Die Hard life. Sure. Is uh, jurisdictional infighting. Mm -hmm. You see it in Die Hard itself when uh, agents Johnson and Johnson, no relation, take over. Uh, You see it. The whole idea is to portray all these different uh, suited law enforcement types as uh, ineffective bureaucrats because it takes a single man on the ground to really grind it out and save the day. That makes Um, so much more sense now. Thank you. (laughs) I've seen a lot of these movies. (laughs) So Cole Meany from uh, Star Trek Next Generation uh, and Deep Space Nine takes takes a gun. He sneaks it onto this guy. Uh, onto his DEA age and who gets on the plane. And then next thing we know, Dave Chappelle, speaking of things that are uh, not aging well, he lights mm. up the, the Native American guy sitting yeah, next to him. So, so, and so only, Dave Chappelle sort of, yeah, go ahead. Grab I was just going to say, and only ever refers to him in any way with, with the most surface level Native references, calling him chief and Kemosabi and doing all the Cochise, stuff that Cochise just is not, yeah. not great. Not great. Yeah. What I love is that the plane takes off 22 minutes in. 22 minutes in, that Mm -hmm. plane is on the runway and into the air. Don't waste my time. I love it. So, yeah, so so everything goes wrong, right? They, 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 they All hell breaks loose on the plane. Can you actually fire a gun in a pressurized compartment? I don't know how that works. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that that actually works. But we they do it plenty of times in this film, so we're over it. Uh, the DEA guy gets killed. A bunch of other dudes get killed. And, and by now, the way, yeah, my favorite, favorite moment of this movie is when the DEA agent gets shot and he looks up at Nick Cage and Nick Cage's face is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he For just... like two minutes, he's been saying like, calm down, dude. And then the DEA agent's like, what did I do? And Nick Cage is just like, mm. I kind of told you so. This I one's a little on you, isn't it? This one's on you. You offended you offend him a little bit. You know, yeah. you, uh, uh, you a little bit. Yeah. And then, so just as John Cusack is putting the pieces together, uh, that's when the transfer is happening. Now they're bringing MC Ganey, Steve Buscemi, and uh, the money guy, uh, the Sindino, who's kind of, I guess yeah. he's the brains of this operation. He's the guy who has guys. the connection to the cartel. Yeah. Which... Makes me wonder, like, if Sandino was in a different prison from Cyrus, how did they coordinate this effort? Yeah, I can't quite make sense of the the pieces that get them from place to place. And I frankly don't care. The more I try to think about it, I just go, I don't care. It definitely uh, seems I, like I just... Cyrus is the mastermind because we find that he uh, had a false brick compartment in his jail cell at one point with all the plans and everything. That's and also true. a bomb he was able to construct in prison. Um very interesting uh but uh yeah he planned it but i don't know how he got in touch with sandino maybe he was visited by a cartel guy who was like i know another guy can you plan this i can build a version of that where like he's got a guy on the outside who's contacting all these people and we just never meet that person i would like to meet that person maybe we will in con air too uh so yeah Chappelle doesn't make it back to the plane yeah they Uh, kill off Chappelle way too early yeah i mean Chappelle is clear I mean this guy is just swinging at the first pitch and hitting <laughs> singles and doubles and just getting on base he also caused the prison break that none of this happens without him he sets right. the native american guy on fire he gets up he releases all the cages like all of this goes down because uh he had the good sense to swallow a condom full of gasoline and matches ooh 
But he had to he had to die so early because he needed to be the dead body with a note on it that lands on the car of the guy from Twin Peaks. Yeah, let's talk about like a scientific aspect. Oh man, that's one of the best sentences I've ever heard. (laughs) (laughs) A body falling from let's say I don't know thirty thousand feet. Oh, he would have been liquefied. He would have been just liquefied. Would have been like a bomb exploding. Right. At what point? At what velocity does a human body become terminal? Like, at what point is he not accelerating anymore? Is what I wonder. I, I don't know. That sounds like work for a different podcast. Yeah, it's super fair. <laughs> uh, but if his terminal velocity is low enough, then he could be, remain solid uh, when he when he when he uh, achieves impact. I don't know these things. I'm not a physicist. I just write scary movies and overanalyze Con Air. So uh, where are we at? So Poe, he uh, he sent the he sent the le- the letter. Ah, yes, the next big moment of the film, Billy Bedlam sneaks into the undercarriage of the plane, and he's reading Poe's letters back and forth to his little daughter, and he has the bunny in his hand, and he knows exactly what Cameron Poe's up to. Yeah, and what uh, and there's one thing that he could have done to save his life, and he did not do it. Um, he did not put, put the bunny back in the box. Put um, the bunny back in the box. In the box. Why couldn't you put, put the bunny back in the box? Why we... Guys, are, please stop. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be offended at this You got to put now. the bunny I've, back in the box. Uh, you know, God. we can... Scoop. So we get... <laughs> so that's the end of Billy Bedlam. Uh, Bye, Billy. Yeah, he uh, goes out thanks to an exposed pipe. Um... Yeah, that's pretty sweet. Chest. It's it's pretty cool. This movie has some really really good practical effects, both in the gore departments. The squib game in this movie is on point. Everybody <laughs> is apparently full of tomato sauce, um, and if you get shot, you are going to spritz that shit everywhere. I I live for this squib game. Uh, then we get our we get the passenger plane fake out scene. Next, where they, where they, where the DEA surrounds that 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 little plane full of of nice old white people. Mon um, Paquette. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, and then and then uh, Con Air lands at Lerner, and uh, they're they're ready to escape. You know, they're planning their escape, but but uh, I'm sorry, I keep losing his name. Sind- Sind- Sindino, where's yeah. the where's the plane? How are we going to get out of here? Yeah, we don't know. It- Turns out what, what I was able to surmise about their scheme was because we do find out that the jet is actually hidden inside of a tent. And it seems like Cindy, the cartel guys were just going to grab Sindino and go. Yeah. That's they what only I got. actually yeah. cared about him. And they were going to let the rest of the cons just sort of twist in the wind. Um, but all of that gets um, gets mucked up because uh, Special Agent uh, Federal Marshal Vince Larkin has figured things out. Stolen uh, Colm Meany's sweet uh, Corvette Stingray and driven all the way over there uh, so that he can put a stop to everything. Because now we've got, uh, he's basically our Al Powell through this movie. He is our Reginald Vell Johnson. Um, but he's given a whole lot more to do than Reginald Vell Johnson uh, is in Die Hard. But he's the one guy, because there's always got to be one bureaucrat who gets it um, so that he can aid them. Like, guys, it's Die Hard. I'm telling you. No, it's great. Um, I never made that connection. I love it. <laughs> um and uh, yeah, he shows up and, uh, you know, watches a kill box get formed. And then he hijacks a fucking snowplow, which is in the Nevada desert for some reason, <laughs> um, in order to uh, provide some cover for these National Guard guys. Uh, there's some really great stuff that happens in this sequence. Some yeah. uh, probably uh, some unforgettable lines of dialogue. Uh, uh, and I've got one right here. Please. Anara. He was so quick. He was so quick with that Anara. Yeah. Like he so, knew so, so. he's waiting for someone to say his name in a pleading way so he can just get Anara in there. Well, he's he's been just ready with it. He's been in prison for 25 years. He's had a lot of time to think up his, to up his quip game. Right. Uh, what if somebody yells sigh? I'll just say Anara, and then boom, they're dead. Uh, he definitely has a moleskin full of these. Um, it's next to the plane plans that, the, that, uh, that Larkin found. John Malkovich allegedly was unhappy during production because How? allegedly the script was being rewritten every day. I don't believe it. 
right? I, I can't quite get that from his performance. He does not seem annoyed at all whatsoever with every line of dialogue that he's saying, except when he says Anara, he's just like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> take, take me back to the hotel. That's a wrap for John, and uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. Everybody got their, their call sheets for tomorrow? Company move? Let's go. Yeah, and, yeah. And yet one thing I found was that he actually wasn't the first choice to play Cyrus. The yeah. first choice was Gary Oldman, which I feel Gary like would Oldman, have been yeah, that interesting. Would have been a, that would have been a good casting choice as well, I think. Well, let's talk about 1997 for a second, especially with Gary Oldman being the first choice to play Cyrus. Gary Oldman is the hijacker on the plane in Air Force One, which mm. comes out in 1997. And so you're talking two movies in 1997 about airplanes being hijacked. And would you guys be surprised if I told you there was a third? No. What, which one was ah, it? Ah, there is a lovely movie. Was it Executive Decision? <laughs> oh, no, that's 96. Okay. So 97 <laughs> uh, in January, there was a wonderful movie called Turbulence starring Lauren Holly and Ray Liotta. Turbulence! <laughs> right? I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I scrubbed through that movie yesterday. It's available to stream on Tubi TV currently. Uh, it's not worth your time, but... Uh, yeah, you're talking three movies within like six months about planes getting hijacked and 97 simpler times, huh? Uh, and here's something we haven't touched on at all is Steve Buscemi in this film. As he, Hannibal, I mean Garland Green. Garland Green, the Hannibal Lecter, you know, he wanders off during this sequence and meets a little girl. Uh, and, and we're all afraid that he's just going to, I don't know, eat her face. They really want us to believe he murdered that girl for like a, for like a good five, 10 minute chunk of this movie. When he like yeah. comes back, we see the broken teacup after the tea party. We see the, we see the Barbie doll. And like, I was sitting there, my, my wife had seen, uh, had never seen this movie and she's watching it and she's just sitting here horrified at the tonal break that in this fun action movie, <laughs> we just had an off camera child murder. Um, <laughs> until eventually it definitely in reshoots um they're like no nah, no nah, he didn't kill the kid but you thought he did didn't you <laughs> yeah um, he had a change of heart what an odd choice <laughs> so the plane the plane takes off again we're back in the air sweet home alabama is blaring so baby o gets his insulin so he's he's like all good it it is awesome and then ving rames he's up he figures out what poe's up to and tell Cyrus. Now we have a traitor in our midst. Yeah. Nicholas Cage w worked worked so hard to get this guy's insulin just so he could get shot in the stomach, which leads to maybe one of my favorite line readings in this movie. Jesus! Can we park on this insulin thing for a second? Sure. Because, um... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, and I love that anytime there's pathos in this movie, you get the nylon string mariachi guitar as opposed to the fucking rockin' power chord guitar, which tells us that it's time for fun. Um, Unbelievable, right? The, yeah. the, the, the musical score in this movie is, it's just like, it's not holding any punches. No, it's bangers it's, wall to wall. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, you know, we're going to play the hits and we're yeah. not even going to hold anything back. Let's get this electric guitar going while Cameron Poe's jumping through fire because, you know what, that's what people want. That's yeah. what people you, came to you see. You know how you're supposed to feel based on what type of guitar is providing you with sweet riffs um, at any given time. But the riffs are uniformly sweet. But anyway, the, the central conflict of this thing, the whole reason that Vince Larkin gets onto the fact that uh, they have somebody uh, willing to help them on the plane the whole reason Cameron's on there thinking like he's going to quote, save the fucking day and everything is because he stays on the plane when he has a chance to get off the plane. Um, when, because he wants to get baby O his insulin. And because he wants to stop the, uh, the guard from being raped by Johnny 23. Oh, that's right. That's the other reason. But as far as the insulin, why not? Because we, at, while Cyrus, the virus is a complete shit pile of a human being, we see that he does feel some loyalty towards his fellow cons. So why not at some point say, Cyrus, this prisoner over here is dying, which later we find out that Cyrus definitely noticed that this guy's on death's door. Um, why not say like, this guy needs insulin. Can we get him some insulin so that this prisoner who is part of our operation doesn't die and he can be useful? Like, you know, that's a, that's a good point you're making because I feel like Cyrus may not have veered from his original plan but i think cyrus would have 
stared. He would have, he would have looked Cameron Poe directly in his eyes and said, I'll see what I can do. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's it. And that's all we need. Yeah. And, or he could have said, Hey, we're in a junkyard. Do you mind if I go instead of lying whenever they get to Lerner airfield and saying, I'm going to go get the fuel truck, which he does not do. And at no point does Cyrus say, why didn't you come back with the fuel truck? <laughs> <laughs> he could have said, Hey, my friend is dying. Do you mind if I go find a syringe? Um, like it seems very reasonable. Um, but again, this movie's not concerned with reason. Um, because, and I, I hope we get to talk about the tone of this thing in a minute, because, uh, I, I, I think we're watching a cartoon and I don't mind. Yep. So we're back in the air. We're back in yep. the air with Colm Beasley's car in tow. Colt, was it? You said mm. Beasley. Yeah. I don't know his name. <laughs> <laughs> the, the dude with the really round head and little face. <laughs> Uh, so uh, McKelty Williamson gets shot as we're up in the air again, and then he gets his shot. Then he gets shot. Oh, is <laughs> yeah. We're up in the air. Then he gets shot. Uh, we get the "I'm going to show you God does exist" line from Nick Cage. Oh, it's lovely. Which is just beautiful. Um, Followed by and- the guitar solo. Hey, where you going? I'm going to show you God does exist. He fights his way to the cockpit. We have a tense scene with the Air Force. They want to sh- they want to shoot them down. Nick Cage is like, "Don't! I got the plane now," uh, or something like that. Your uh, accent just now was better than his in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then here we go: the awesome crash landing into the Vegas Strip while Steve Buscemi screaming. He's got the whole world in his hands the whole time. Love that scene. I love everything okay, so, about this. So here's a good point for, uh, I, I wanted to ask you guys the worst decisions made in this movie. Okay. By the filmmakers or the characters? Uh, the characters. Billy Bedlam not putting the bunny in the box. Oh yeah. Cameron Poe's lawyer telling him to plead guilty. <laughs> uh, the prison guard opening the box inside Cyrus's cell moments after Cusack says not to touch anything only to result in a giant explosion killing them all. Or, the correct answer, John Cusack not shooting down the plane, basically sentencing hundreds of Las Vegas citizens to their deaths. Did we see any Las Vegas citizens die? Come on. We Come don't on. see anybody die in Man of Steel either, but we know what happened. It was a yeah. safe landing. And that's why Man of Steel sucks. Uh, so the plane, the plane crashes, everyone, it, it's, it's mass chaos and destruction. Nobody dies uh, on the strip. Uh, uh, <laughs> Danny Trejo's arms get torn off. Cyrus escapes. McKelty Love Williamson. that shot, by the way, the, the Danny Trejo thing. That was yeah, the rest excellent. Of the that was nice. It's excellent. also, uh, it's, it, which came out first, this or Die Hard with a Vengeance? Because there's a similar gag in Die Hard with a Vengeance. Die Hard with a Vengeance was 95. Okay. So, so this came out afterwards. Because there's that scene where Samuel L. Jackson and uh, Bruce Willis grab the guy by the head and the feet, and then they pull him in such a way that it's revealed off camera that he's in two pieces. Right, um, right. This is the same gag, but I, it never gets old for me. Excellent gag. We should be reusing that gag. We should be reusing it costs, that gag. It costs like $0 yeah. to, to do that gag. No CGI whatsoever, and it's very effective. Let's bring it back. Bring back that gag. So, so Cyrus escapes. Bubba gets sent to the hospital. The the, the guard that, that Poe was, 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 uh, was protecting that whole time she goes, hey, Poe, next time, take the bus. <laughs> and we, and but, it but, almost feels like the movie's over, except we know Cyrus got away, so it's not over yet. We know he got away because he poked his little head out the bottom of the plane right. like Bugs fucking Bunny. <laughs> 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 I love that shot. That's, that's when I was sure, like, okay, we are straight up what, like, he is a Looney Tunes villain. A hundred percent. And then we get the awesome chase scene where the bad guys are on a fire truck john cusack and nicholas cage steal police bikes and just chase after them (laughs) and give each other a knowing look and john cusack's like cool (laughs) you're definitely just a dude and not law enforcement (laughs) but uh let's do this and this is also the point where we get that that payoff you know almost a hundred minutes later from all of that working out that cameron poe was doing in prison when he's he's doing those like one arm pull ups on that fire engine, the, just the like fire engine. Uh, holding, and I've I've tried that before. We you, you hold on to something, then you grab your forearm with the other hand, to some extra leverage. 
You know, that's that's some excellent screenwriting there. Should have been nominated for three Oscars. That's called plant and payoff in the industry. Damn guys. right. Plant and payoff. Yeah. I like that yeah. scene a lot because there's there's <laughs> An action movie is always exciting to me when they show me something I haven't seen before. And, yeah. you know, maybe this is, maybe that, maybe the fire truck thing has been done before, but I hadn't seen it. But like shooting the hose around and using Love that. Love that. And, uh, that was good. And even Very... also like going back to, hearkening back to the, the, the car uh, being towed by the plane. I hadn't seen that. So like anytime I can see an action movie that's going to show me something new, I'm like, I don't care. This is good. So for a bit of context, though, I do feel like this was part of that era in 90s action movies where they would be planned around um, a big stunt at the climax. And like the 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 Na plus ultra of this was the cruise ship crashing into the docks in Speed 2, which oh. was so huge that there was a documentary about it. And they like did so they good. built a practical front of the cruise ship. And like the Vegas crash is that in this movie. Um, yeah, you know, that makes you sense. had to have like a big explodey thing with incalculable loss of life that we just don't discuss. Um, because tonally, again, we are watching a cartoon. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and speaking of cartoon, how does John Malkovich see... What is his fate? He gets flung off the fire truck through an overpass. He's then electrocuted by a number of electrical wires and then magically transported onto a construction site yeah, where, where he so, definitely had plenty of time to get out of the way of a pile driver. <laughs> yeah, and then he just takes it right to the face. You know, I, I've I've had a problem with with uh, Cyrus the Virus's demise since I watched this movie as a as a young young Garrett uh, for two reasons. One, it's very contrived, and even at the age of like 10, 11 years old, I, I felt that's a little too much. And then he's magically on this conveyor belt and. <laughs> And then, and, 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 and then and off then, the conveyor belt, right? but when he fell off, he also fell like 15 yes. feet to the right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But also if you're going to smash his head, like go for the gold, like give me a David Cronenberg, uh, uh, type like explosion of the head. Like give me something that's just Dennis Hopper's head coming off at the end of speed. Yeah. Not just his limbs going limp. It's not. It's I needed really, more. I needed more. Anticlimactic. Well. Those chunks. And then. Down. <laughs> then we get to the reunion. You're going to play the song again, aren't you? No. You have to. You have to. No, you Do don't. I have to? You don't have to. You will have to. Um, yeah. uh, play, we'll play it underneath it as we explain it. Uh, <laughs> sexy slow-mo Nick Cage. He, he rescues the bunny from the sewer. He he sees his wife and daughter for the first time since since forever. And how do I live without you? It starts playing, and it zooms in on Let's talk about that bunny. Face. Let's talk about that bunny. That bunny Filthy. is evidence. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Poe, that bunny should be bagged and labeled. Bagged and And tagged. probably has 18 different strands of DNA all over it. Yeah. Uh, with all the blood splatter going on in this movie. Uh, just, it's also a just Nicolas pointing out, Cage. Uh, he came up with the idea to have the bunny. Oh, he did. Um, according according <laughs> to the research that I did, um, he because the script was so loose, there was a lot of areas for people to play with their characters. Oh. And he said, "I want this bunny to be a big part of my character." <laughs> He's you know, a genius. And, 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 and they're on set going, well, this guy just won an Oscar. Maybe we should just listen to what he says. And, and Malkovich is over here like, can I just get a friggin' script? Yeah. That's all I want. I'll just bend the bunny. I think the bunny gives us an emotional through line to the movie that it I needs agree. to be more than like just a series of explosions. We, we never have a question as to what Cameron Poe wants at any point in the movie. We do have questions about the actions he undertakes to achieve what he wants. Um, but well, He wants to give the bunny to his daughter. That's, that's, that's what it. he wants. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. There it is. It's a visual. I think it's a solid addition. Let's talk about this reunion. There is a 0.0% chance that Monica Potter waits eight years for Cameron to come back. Now, now I, I, I will allow for the possibility that she brings Casey, the daughter there, but... She found some Trisha. Else, Trisha's got a new husband who's just very understanding. Maybe he's like an insurance salesman. Uh, uh, <laughs> he's he's standing there, sort of like, "Oh man, you lived a life before you met me, huh?" Uh, and he's just Golly standing Willikers. there. 
uh, looking aloof. Maybe he's played by Judge Reinhold. You know, it's oh, perfect yeah, casting. Yeah. Let's, let's throw him in there. Judge Reinhold kind of looks like he could maybe compete with Nicolas Cage. So yeah, like there's just like, there's there's no way Monica Potter shows up and she's just like yeah, let's just pick up where we left off. Yeah, she's she's I, I'm really sorry. I got to get home to Neil. Um, he's been away. For, I've been away for a few days and I left him a lasagna in the freezer, but like he doesn't know how to cook. So. <laughs> So, so we get we get our our crescendo of how do I live, and then cut to Steve Buscemi walking free in Vegas. Love it, love you know, it. <laughs> they'll they'll never fa- they'll never find him. They they wouldn't even yeah. think to look for him. Excellent. Uh, and then we get what I love is the end credits with yes. the actors and yes. the character yes. names. Can you please do this for every movie? Yes. I want this yeah. for yes. every freaking movie. Yes, yes, yes. I was I wrote this down. I wanted to make sure we didn't skip over it. Yeah. It's like when you're watching at the end of Ghostbusters and it cuts to footage of the actors and sometimes it's it's footage of them in the movie but sometimes it's 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 behind the scenes footage of them acting. You yeah. know, it's it's always fun. I love it. I love it. We need to do this more often. I don't know what kind of movies we can do it during. It's the it's it's the filmmakers letting you know that they know what kind of movie you just watched. And they were like, hey, guys, we had fun hanging out, didn't we? Here's all your yeah. friends one last time. <laughs> all right. Safe is. drive. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's 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 a it's a film version of a curtain call. Mm-hmm. Where where you've mm-hmm. got yeah. this ensemble yeah. cast and you really just want everybody to take a bow. And we need that more often. Yeah, than just absolutely. rolling yeah. the credits by. And I'm so glad, Greg, that, that you... I'm glad that our minds are, are are as one when it comes to this beautiful credit trope that we need to bring back. It's it's delightful. It always... it always, it's Because it's also a thing like where like you're watching a movie, you see the actors in it, you go, who is that? I know who that is. And then at yeah. the end, they just tell you. Yeah, that's, that's what great. I want. Yeah, That's right. This guy was this guy, name. and this guy was this guy. It's yep. awesome. <laughs> Um, yeah, and it's it's it speaks to a larger tonal thing going on in action movies now. We're like, don't get me wrong, I love a lot of the action movies we get nowadays. You know, modern action movies are like your John Wicks and everything, leaving superhero movies aside, because I get that they are the modern action blockbusters, but like we 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 don't uh we, we don't really think of those in the same way. Which actually I, I, I do have one last thing to say about that vis-a-vis like the big action set piece. The really cool about the really cool thing about the '90s action set piece thing, like the Speed Two uh, boat and like the Vegas crash in this movie and on and on, is that it gave you a feeling of how did they do that? Yes. And now in superhero movies, it's like, oh, there's a green screen. There's a fucking green screen. Yeah. Um, but like, I genuinely like would watch a documentary just about how they crashed that plane on the strip, um, yeah. and all the different like rigs that were involved and where they placed the cameras and everything. I would want to know that very badly. I don't yeah, give when, a shit how they did anything <laughs> in Infinity War. Um, yeah, I, I remember watching like the behind the scenes featurettes of like Independence Day and they showed you the miniatures and then the cinematographer would come on and and talk about the different uh, the different camera and frame rate that they would film the the miniature uh, explosion uh, at so that yeah. it would seem more lifelike and 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 cutting that together with real real life footage and there was this real I'm not going to say CGI isn't an art because I mean, it's literally it very much art. Is. It's literal art. It's imagery. Yeah. Um, there's just this, this, this magician aspect that is lost in movies today where I don't wonder how they did that. And I'm watching, I was watching speed Two recently, uh, by the way, underrated Willem Dafoe, uh, uh oh, performance yeah. there. Love Willem Dafoe who is, uh, uh, considered for Cyrus the virus in this movie, but instead took speed Two in 97. We've really talked a lot about Speed 2 in this. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. What a, what a perfect movie. Uh, before we do some sort of closing, do you guys have anything you want to touch upon? I want to ask, do we think that this movie could be better if they had cast someone other than Nick Cage? Yes. How would that have changed it? Absolutely. I, think, I feel like John might have an opinion on that, so I wanted to throw that out there. Out there. Absolutely. His accent's atrocious. Um, I think there are plenty of people who could have carried this movie in the 90s better than he does. I would love... I would love to have seen a Jean-Claude Van Damme version of this. Um, you know, hard target era Van Damme, I think would have been really, really cool. Um, I also think that if they had just told uh, Nicolas Cage to cool it with the fucking accent, yeah. uh, it would have been a lot better. Um, the accent, like, I, I, I do enjoy this movie. I think I've made that clear. Nicolas Cage's accent alone lowers it a letter grade for me. Every time he opens his fucking mouth, I hate it. <laughs> I wouldn't change a thing. 
it's <laughs> particularly terrible. It's particularly yeah. terrible. It's awful. And, and, and you know, you could, you could throw Bruce Willis in there. You could throw Jason Patrick in there. You could throw Kurt Russell in Jason there. Jason Patrick. You could, you What's could, with you the could, Speed Two references? I'm just saying. You could, take, <laughs> you, could you could replace Nicholas. K- really, I think the only there are only there are only three people, three characters in this movie that I cannot replace. Okay. And it's Dave Chappelle as pinball. I need him as pinball. I need Steve Buscemi. Yep. And I need John Malkovich as Cyrus the Virus. And everybody else in this movie can be replaced with different actors. And I think it's I'm just gonna, as, oh, you I, know what? I, I'll give an honorable mention to Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing does not get the credit that <laughs> no, he deserves. He He's, has some That's wonderful true. line readings in this movie. Yeah. And kudos to him. I'm going to also say that I don't want to replace John Cusack because he, uh, and I know this is controversial, but I think I think he gives me the right energy of like, a dude who's not used to field work, but is just stuck in this situation and is a little bit resentful of the fact that this is his day to day, but understands what needs to be done. Hot take. Give me Joan Cusack. This movie's a better movie. <laughs> Honestly, maybe. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I, I wouldn't change, I wouldn't change a thing about this movie. In fact, if it were to be remade, I would insist whoever was doing the lead part would have to put on an indecipherable accent as well in the remake that should be part of the legacy of a con air is that whoever stars in the next one has to put on an equally terrible <laughs> accent that you cannot place as long as there's not a boston <laughs> accent I've, I've heard way too many terrible boston accents in no, the course of make my him life. from rural maine like he's a stephen <laughs> king protagonist <laughs> right. so, so, so let's talk don't let's go talk down that re- road this cons <laughs> let's talk re-ip you've you've got con air do you remake it as a movie do you reboot it do you turn it into a tv series or do you just leave it alone leave it as is there's no reason to remake this movie because it's a perfect film and you're not going to make a better one but It is ripe for a remake because it's just such a fun concept and you could put any number of awesome uh, character actors in this film and have a, and and just like have a blast. You know, you get like a, like a Bobby Cannavale or a, or a Michael K. Williams or something and you, you just like pump it up with character actors. I think you could, Mm. you could have a hell of a movie, but it, will it ever be the original Con Air? No, I don't think so. I I have a take here. I I think... Uh, of course, you're going to eliminate a lot of the racism out of this movie. Uh, you're going to, but not eliminate... all of it. Nope, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it. You're going to eliminate the Sally can't dance uh, uh, character, which just is handled incredibly poorly. And yeah. really, it's it's one of the more, I, I would say, it's probably the most cringeworthy aspect aspect of this movie, more so than the blatant racism. Yeah, if they is... wanted to have, like, a queer character like that in the movie, I think that's fine, but like, the fact that he, uh, I guess she, because she seems to identify as female, um, the fact that she uh, is a prisoner and has that connotation, like, I don't, this movie has not earned the goodwill for me to not, like, get prison bitch vibes from it, if you know what I Absolutely. mean. Absolutely. You know? So my take here is you, you remake Con Air, okay? And and it's a remake, not a reboot. It's a movie, except with, with the political climate we're in and, and criminal justice reform, a big a big issue that, that's talked about. I, I would turn Con Air into sort of like a fugitive situation mm. where the cons are the heroes. They are the baby faces that we, 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 we rally behind, when they take over the plane and it's, it's the guys on the ground that are, you know, the system, man, the system Dostoevsky, right? I mean, it's not hard to, uh, this movie is almost there. Like the guys on the ground are clearly the kind of guys that were like, this system is terrible. Yeah. That's the reason that we need to get rid of. I mean, there's a dialogue scene of Larkin actively calling out Malloy for his dehumanization of the criminal element. Uh, I, I know I said I'd, I'd like to see a remake, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't be opposed to a direct sequel with a convoluted reason why Cameron Poe also has to be on this plane again. 
Well, I saw that in a 2014 interview, uh, Simon West said that he would be open to a sequel, but thought that maybe it should be in space. Yes. Well, of course so, Simon West perfect. is open to it. I mean, the guy hasn't made a big budget movie since Laura Croft Tomb Raider in, yep. what, 2004? Speaking of him, another fun fact I found, this was his first full-length feature, but before that, he directed Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up music video you know that's the funnest fact will has ever brought to this podcast yeah. and i, know I will never ridicule a fun fact ever again because that was that was worth it that was so this was whole blast. podcast was just a rick roll thanks for listening <laughs> folks <laughs> <laughs> never gonna so 1997's what? con air 75 million dollar production budget made 224 million at the international box office you can't make this movie for $75 million today. I'm, I'm frankly, you probably can't make any movie for $75 million today. It's either 5 million, 50 million or 300 million. That's pretty much, do I, you know. do I get to say if I'd remake it or not? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, it sounded like you were moving on. I didn't mean to step on you. I was like, wait, no, go ahead. Well, what about, what we'll, about old we'll keep this in. Uh, we'll keep this in. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I really like your, uh, pitch for a, uh, for a sequel reboot, uh, Garrett. I would go, uh, I'd kind of split the difference and say we do make the, there's definitely an abjectly evil element on the plane again, but the um, the main character needs to be a, uh, a person of color who's maybe been wrongfully accused of something yeah. or something like that, kind of caught in the gears of the justice system. And the only person who believes him and knows that there's someone on that plane is Federal Marshal Cameron Poe who got the job after Vince Larkin saw how good he was at it. And now that's what he does. And he's a federal marshal. So now we've got Cage, but now Cage is the the the, the Al Powell. He's the guy on the ground. Well, I got, got a, another guy in the I air. I got to burst your bubble here, John. You know? That movie was kind of made. And it's a movie called U.S. Marshals. And it's the sequel to The Fugitive I mean, with no, Leslie but no Snipes. One, but no one who's cares in a about plane, U.S. Marshals. And who's in a out. plane that crashes. And there's only one person who believes him. It's Tommy Lee Jones, and I'm not quite sure he believes him, but Robert Downey Jr.'s in it, and the U.S. Marshals, underrated, huh. underrated little PG-13. Late I definitely had U.S. Books. I, I, I get that I'm serving some U.S. Marshals energy, but I want to stay on the plane and make it a reboot in the sense that it's largely rehashing the plot of the original, but with, you know, some slight changes and a chance to get Cameron Poe and his war crime of an accent um back in front of the camera <laughs> you know what if 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 they oh god oh this movie would just be beyond perfect if they replaced john cusack with tommy lee jones i tell you what man oh mm. oh hmm. no you can't just you can't do it. that because then you'd have a guy with an actual southern accent acting against nicholas cage <laughs> Ooh, that would be bad <laughs> that was one thing i wondered about like while watching this what does it have to be like to act against Nicolas Cage? Uh, it's uh, like you're just holding on for dear life, I feel like. Oh, it's it's definitely a lot of reacting, a lot of zigging and zagging and just like finding <laughs> the moment, I guess. Sure. I yeah. mean, Harrison Ford had to have been offered the Nick Cage role, right, of Cameron Poe and probably turned it down. Why wouldn't you put the bunny in the basket? <laughs> <laughs> like you know when you, when you it's sort of like this jack lemon walter Matthau thing i'm sure yeah. there were so many producers that tried to get harrison ford and tommy lee jones in just subsequent ash, action movies playing different characters yep. afterwards yep. i imagine con air was one of them and i'm going to talk myself into that being reality and not just <laughs> speculation what? so i think we've talked all we can about con air uh greg do you have anything to plug where can we nah, find you online? Just find me on the Twitter at It's Greg Han and on Instagram at It's Greg's Toys. John, how about you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, uh, at I Better Be Funny. And uh, I have a thing I've been working on that I can't talk about yet. But hopefully once I can talk about it, I can come back around and uh, finally talk about the black hole on this podcast. Because damn it, someday... We're gonna watch the black hole and talk about it. Um, well, well, I think once we're st once we stop living in the black hole, super fair. I might be down for talking about uh, uh, the movie The Black Hole. So that's we'll get to that's it. very fair. Uh, it's not a sunny film, um, but yeah, I uh, hopefully soon I'll be able to tell you guys a little bit more about something really really fun and cool I've been working on. Um, Excellent. But now I can't plug it, so I don't know why I'm still talking about it. Yeah, that's all right. We can always <laughs> cut it. How about you, Will? Uh, no, nah, just this podcast, my dude. All right. Well, we want to thank you for listening to the D Plus cast. Uh, you can find us 
on Twitter, on Instagram. We are at D plus cast, all spelled out. D P L U S C A S T. Like us on Facebook, find us on YouTube, smash that subscribe button. And before you do anything else, John, please go watch face off. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to get on that today. Don't worry. Guys. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for listening to the D plus cast. We'll talk to you soon.